For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. What is often missed in this verse is its direct connection to its previous verse. So I want you to see what we were. We were foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts, pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, hating. We ourselves were also, which means that the first group of people he was talking about are foolish, disobedient, deceived. They have various lusts and pleasures. They live in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. But so were we at one point. Now, why does that connect backwards? Because go back a screen to verse 2. Speak evil of no one. Be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Speak evil to nobody. Show humility to everybody. Next verse. For we ourselves were also... Okay, so everybody that you're speaking peace to and everybody that you're humble in front of is foolish, disobedient, deceived, got lust, pleasure, malice, envy, hateful, hating. Shouldn't our first obligation be to make sure that our audience knows they're foolish, disobedience, deceived, have lust, various pleasures, envy, hate, and are hateful? Shouldn't that be what the church exists for? To make sure that everybody in verse 2 knows that they have verse 3 as their problem. It's amazing to me that the church has become a place where we can professionally, although we have all of our credentials is we had 10 Bibles. We can professionally diagnose what's wrong with you spiritually. And it's always sin. Foolish, disobedient, disease, everything. But I love how Paul treats it. Paul says, look, I know they've got problems. But what I don't want you to forget is you yourselves were also. In fact, he says we. What a great preacher. He doesn't preach down to his audience. He throws himself in the middle of their problem. He says, I myself was once foolish and disobedient and deceived and various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hate and hating one another. This is what we did. This is who we were. Guess what? You still live in a world where people are still doing that. Amazingly enough, most people that are living in sin have a pretty good understanding that they're living in sin. In fact, the reason that they walked through the door was not so that they could get your confirmation on top of their sin. But rather they thought maybe there was hope somewhere. The reason why I love everybody that walks through that door, and I've told you this before, but I want to keep reiterating this. No matter who they are, no matter their lifestyle, no matter how they're dressed, no matter their background, no matter what they've done to us, said to me, or have been a part of, when they walk through that door, they are there because there is a flicker somewhere in their heart that something might happen if they show up. A flicker. Some of them, that's all they got is a flicker. And that's okay because we're just going to fan that little flicker. I may not be able to get them on fire before they leave, but I'm just going just to blow on it a little bit. Because just let that, and that's why I'm not this, this guy that gets to the end of the service and goes, okay, uh, everybody come forward that wants to receive Christ. Now fill this card out. Go back here in this room. We're going to talk to you and tell you what you just did. S sign you up for baptism next week. I come to the end of a lot of sermons. We don't even give, a, we don't give formal altar calls at midnight. What do we do? We just let the Holy Spirit talk to you. I believe that can work. I'm just crazy enough to believe he knows what he's doing. And so we get to the end of the service. I go, you just let the, walk into your faith. Walk into it. What's that mean? That means you believe a little bit more today than you did last week. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is so good that he knows where you live. And he knows where you work. And he even can figure out which car is yours. So he'll meet you there. And he'll walk with you. And you'll walk into that faith and start to believe. So this is where Paul said, i got to really speed up. See, I'm so excited to be able to share this with you that I've slowed down far too much. We've got, we've got a lot more work to do. Verse 4. But, here's your rebuttal. Remember the last verse is, we used to be, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Now, you would need a full chapter of context to really figure out what that word appeared means because in Titus 2, 11 and 12, he said, the grace of God hath appeared unto us, teaching us to deny ungodly lusts. And grace is a person and his name is Jesus. So in Titus 2, we're told that Jesus, grace, hath appeared and he will tell you how to live. 
Now in Titus 3, he says, when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. When was that? When grace showed up on the scene. Who was grace? Jesus. When did the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appear? In Jesus. Do you want to see what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Do you want to see how kind and compassionate and loving God is? Look at Jesus. This is an important step for for us as believers, is to understand this key phrase. I don't want to stay here too long because I'm going to come back. When the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, what happened? There's a comma, so something's coming. Verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You didn't do anything for it. It was a work of righteousness, not which you have done, but according to His mercy, He saved you. How did He do it? He washed you into a regenerated state. That's regened. New DNA, spiritually. He renewed you by His Holy Spirit. Verse 6. Whom He poured out on us abundantly through whom? Not your works. He poured it out on you abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So when you receive Christ, immediately... You are saved, washed, regenerated. The Holy Spirit begins His regenerative work inside of you. He pours it out on you how much? Key word, abundantly. Don't ever forget it. God didn't barely save you, half save you, maybe save you, save you just enough till your next sin. He hath abundantly poured out on you all righteousness. Don't read one verse, read them all. The connection is, you used to be this, but then Jesus did something abundant, which you didn't deserve, and you didn't earn. It wasn't by your works. It was by His righteousness. According to His mercy, He hath saved us. Verse 7. Next verse. That having been justified by His grace. How were you justified? By His grace. We should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So your justification, which is God's legal, your legal standing in the court of heaven, you are just. There is no case against you. That happened because of grace, not because of works. It did not happen because of the law. The law, in fact, demanded you stand trial. But when you got to trial, it just so happened that somebody had fulfilled your case in front of the judge. His name is Jesus. By His grace, by Jesus, you've been justified so that you should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So what do you have now? You have the promise, not just of eternal life, but that you are an heir of everything in the eternal life. Whatever comes according to eternal life is yours by rights of inheritance. Now, everything we just said is pretty good news, wouldn't you say? Uh, just, just granted, at least from verse 4 on, good news. And you say? 